At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Hello and welcome everyone to another Drug Science Podcast. Tonight I am delighted to have with me the the novelist, journalist and now writer about drugs, Norman Erler from Germany. Welcome, Norman. Hello, I'm very happy to be on the podcast. Yes, well, you've, you've become rather famous, maybe even notorious for your, uh, your first, I suppose, historical text as opposed to novel, which in, in English is called Blitzed. And, well, I'll let you tell people about it. Tell us how you came to write this remarkable book about drugs and Nazi Germany. Well, I had written three novels previously, and I was searching for a topic for my fourth novel. And a friend of mine is a DJ here in Berlin at the Club Visionaries, which is a kind of a known underground uh, venue here in Berlin. And I I asked Alex, because I asked him about a lot of things, I asked him, what should I write about now? And he said, well, you should write about Nazis and drugs. And I said, well, that would be a very short book because the Nazis didn't take any drugs because that is what I thought and that's what basically everyone thought in Germany even though we have been all of us Germans at least West Germans have been taught extensively about the Nazi period all aspects but there was never any mentioning of, of drugs but Alex told me a very peculiar story that a friend of his an antique dealer had just recently, and this was in 2010, recently uh, in 2010, bought an old medicine chest from an old East Berlin apartment and found pills in that medicine chest uh, called Pavitine and on the package, and they were from the 40s, and on the package it said that they contained methamphetamine. And Alex, being a DJ, interested in drugs and not afraid of anything, swallowed these pills and um, told me that they were still working after 70 years. And uh, especially after he swallowed his third pill in a row, he had quite a strong high from this methamphetamine. And this story was so crazy that it actually did get me interested in the topic of Nazis and drugs. And I, I did an extensive search online on the internet, but there was not so much to be found. But I did find this pavitine, this pill, that was actually invented in 1938 by a Berlin company called Temmler. And then I found one medicine historian, a German one, who said that the so-called Blitzkrieg was only possible because of methamphetamine. And that really got me interested. I met this uh, historian. I spoke with him. He had written a small paper that no one had looked at. And he said that he could show me in the archives, several archives across Germany, official archives, where material could be found to this, a lot more material that he had actually looked at yet because he just didn't have the time. So I did then some uh, extensive academic research first and built a case that I uh, then discussed with a leading historian at the time about National Socialism, Hans Mommsen, who basically knew everything about National Socialism but had also never heard about this drug angle and he was um, he then wrote the foreword to my book in german and he was he thought it was uh, interesting interesting findings and he kind of mentored my book and my publisher then said yeah don't write a novel about this we want to know the true story we want to have a non-fiction account and for the first time then i decided to write a non-fiction book i always thought had thought that non-fiction books are boring but this non-fiction book because of its peculiar topic for me as a writer was incredibly unboring 
Well, I think it's true for the uh, hundreds. Did I understand you've sold half a million copies, which is uh, remarkable for a nonfiction book. Yeah, I mean, the story really is interesting. And while I was then writing it, I, I thought this could actually interest uh, more people than just the readers in, in Germany. And this happened to be, be true. And I kind of stumbled on something that, that was a lot of fun for me at the same time and also a, a lot of fun for a lot of readers. So it, it, it made me, as a writer, quite happy, actually, to work on this project. Well, maybe we can discuss the book you know, from two perspectives. There's the, there's the military perspective, which is uh, how you could use a, a powerful, long-acting stimulant like methyl amphetamine to facilitate, or well, actually change the face of war in a way with the Blitzkrieg concept. And then maybe after we could talk a little bit about Hitler and, uh, and the drugs he used. Would you be happy to do that? Absolutely. So, yeah, so maybe just explain to... Some of the uh, people who are listening to this who don't know what a blitzkrieg is, maybe you want to explain what it is and what the term means and how it, where it originated in the Second World War. Well, blitz in German means lightning, and the concept kind of evolved within the German military. It was not something that they had from the beginning, but when Wehrmacht attacked Poland, on September 1st, 1939, which started the Second World War, they made large territorial gains in a very short period of time. They kind of overran the enemy and surprised by like sheer, sheer force and speed. And, and this kind of then later turned into this blitz meme, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And the blitz, in a way, was the only not against Poland, but especially later on in the attack on the West, on France and in England, this blitz idea was in a way the only chance of the Nazi war machine to, to have a success by surprising the enemy with unconventional and, and, and quick and sometimes even irrational behavior. Because especially in the attack on the West, the odds were against Germany, which had a weaker army than the French and the, and the British uh, armies co combined. It was weaker. And usually you need, a, I think, a three, three times stronger army to lead a successful invasion of enemy territory. So the only chance was to surprise the Western allies. And the surprise lay in the decision that was formed in February 1940 to not attack where Britain and France thought the attack would happen, which was in the north of Belgium or more in the south of, or more to the south, but to attack through the Aden Mountains, which was kind of the, the eye of the needle in the middle, like a, a mountainous region in Belgium. So the, the German idea was to charge through those mountains within three days and three nights only if they would a be able to do so, they would surprise the, the, the Western allies and kind of cut them off from the French heartland because the French and the British armies were mostly stationed in Belgium and if in northern Belgium. And if Germany would have attacked there, like in the First World War, it would have been probably a similar standoff than in the First World War. But the Germans were actually able to go through the mountains in three days and three nights without stopping. And this was considered impossible by the Western allies because an army cannot march without, you know, taking a break in the evening. Every human being needs to sleep and needs to, you know, regain the strength of a hard day. But the Germans were using methamphetamine. They were using a lot of methamphetamine. 40 million dosages were used for the attack on the West and methamphetamine actually enables you to stay awake for three days and three nights. Also something that Alex, the DJ uh, would know, Discovered it. <laughs> but no one else, you know, no, in the West, they didn't know this. Mm -hmm. They knew this in Germany because they had already made tests with methamphetamine when it came onto the market in 38, there was a a professor for physiology working for the German army, Professor Otto Ranke, 
And he made tests at the Medical Academy in Berlin with methamphetamine and came up with a theory that this could actually lead to an advantage in a fighting situation because it you know, kills your need to sleep for a few days. If you are on methamphetamine, you can actually stay awake for three days and three nights. It's quite possible. Was he the guy that had people walking continuously? I think I seem to remember that there was one of your scientists had people walking and walking and walking and walking to show how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He made. He was kind of a. I compare him in the book with. Um, I think his name is Q in the James Bond novels. Yeah, like the, yeah. The guy who comes up with gad. He was like a gadget inventor. He, he invented also tropical helmets for the Germans when they when they invaded Africa and but but his main his main gadget was to combat you know it was the pill that would combat sleep that would you know fatigue was his main and it was was the professor's main enemy not the British soldier or the French or the Russian it was fatigue and he found it he found you know a weapon too to combat fatigue, and that was uh, methamphetamine. And it certainly worked. I mean, I, again, I there's that wonderful account in your book of the the French when the Germans had got through the Ardennes, and the French had completely flummoxed because they just couldn't imagine it. No one expected it. And there's this dialogue, I think, was it with, with Churchill? The French are asking Churchill, Look, what's going on? What are we going to do? And Churchill's saying, well, they must stop. But they didn't. Yeah, they did. They just went straight to the coast, and of course, completely encircled the British expeditionary force. So. I mean, armies have always, you know, taken drugs or tried to take drugs since the beginning of you know warfare, basically. But these drugs were usually things like alcohol or tobacco. And when Germany attacked France, hundreds of uh, lorries filled with red wine were moving from the French wine regions to the front line, supplying each French soldier with three quarters of a liter of red wine per day. That was the ratio given to each soldier. So the French soldier was slightly drunk on three quarters of a liter of red wine, while the typical German soldier was totally high on methamphetamine. So this was a asymmetrical you know, fighting situation in a way, because methamphetamine does give you certain you know it, it it is actually efficient for someone who needs to be in a combat situation that's why amphetamines are still being uh, used today in um, combat in combat situations the, the, the nazis were kind of the well not kind of the nazis were the first ones to grasp that idea and to then immediately put it into full effect by supplying millions of their soldiers with the stuff and just to be clear was it trialed out in Poland or did it was it the Ardennes offensive that was the first time they retrialed it? Well Professor Rank wanted the soldiers in Poland to already officially carry it, but his superior didn't get what he was talking about. I mean the he, he wrote about it and he made suggestions and he wasn't taken so seriously, but Pavitin was quite known uh, in the summer of nineteen thirty nine in Germany, so many soldiers were carrying it privately and also many uh, medical officers were just having it but they still needed to buy it from pharmacies and then distribute it so it was a chaotic approach or chaotic use but Rankum um, asked he re requested reports from medical officers from the front lines in Poland to report back to him uh, whether methamphetamine had been used and what were the effects and it was already used a lot and the effects were described as, you know, good for the work, uh, kept the soldier happy, kept the soldier active, lessened the fear, lessened fear in combat situations, all these things that Ranke had anticipated. And then he again wrote to his superior, the Heere Sanitätsinspekteur, I guess in America, you would call him Surgeon General. I don't know what the term in England would be like the highest medical officer of, of the army. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time, because Hitler had decided on this crazy plan to go through the Aden mountains, um, the high, high command was kind of searching for ways to make this, turn this into a success. And then Ranke said, this is what... I see. 
see. So I hadn't understood that. Now, so basically, it it was the other way around. The plan was conceived before methamphetamine yeah. was methamphetamine made the crazy plan work. Aha. Uh -huh. Exactly. High command criticized Hitler. There was actually a lot of criticism of Hitler before the big victory against France. Um, a lot of criticism uh, against Hitler was that this plan that he had come up with in February 1940, a few months before the actual attack, was completely illusionary. It would never work. And then Pavitin basically saved Hitler's ass and uh, made it work. I mean, it was not Hitler's idea. It was the idea of two tank generals, Guderian and uh, Rommel, who, who would later become quite famous as this tank, this crazy mm -hmm. tank general Rommel. Uh, Rommel, they had, they had said, we go through the Aden Mountains. And the criticism was, of course, how can soldiers stay awake for this period of, you know, how can they do it? It's not possible. And Hitler just said, the German soldier can achieve anything. <laughs> he can stay awake. He doesn't have to sleep because he's so convinced yeah. of the national socialist ideals that he has supernatural powers, when in fact, these powers then were uh, pharmacological. And... Do they continue to use it throughout the war? Yeah, they never stopped. The Temmler company was quite proud to be able to produce methamphetamine until the very end of the war because not a lot of hard to get resources. No, no, it wasn't hard to produce it. So they could basically make it from from basic stuff that they that they that they had all the way until the end and also the office that was, you know, this, uh, making sure which resources were still available. They, they made sure that um, pavitin could be produced all the way up until the, the bitter end. And of course, in fact, uh, as you've already alluded to, all the other uh, combatants started using amphetamines. I think the Allies tended to favor amphetamine sulfate, but the Japanese clearly were also using methyl amphetamine. I don't know, did they get that from Germany or did they... Were they told how to make it or did they invent it themselves, you know? Well, actually, the first chemist that ever synthesized it was uh, Nagai. He was from Tokyo in 1917. So it was a Japanese invention. And this was basically the, the, the German, the Temmler company found a new way to synthesize it and was able to patent that. So the Japanese already, they're like the, they like, they have, like, they already had it. And I never researched whether there was communication about pevity, about methamphetamine between Germany and Japan, but I could easily imagine that there was, or at least that the Japanese could see that the Germans were using it uh, successfully, at least in the beginning. And again, with, with this similar kind of effect, I mean, the way the Japanese came down to the Malay Peninsula to Singapore was completely unexpected by the Brits who were sitting there looking out to sea and suddenly the Japanese are cycling up and invade. I mean, no one thought you could travel that fast on a bicycle or that far on a bicycle. So, yeah, the, the ability to go fast and long is clearly something that, that, that methamphetamine gives you. But uh, I guess it was used in, by Rommel in North Africa as well then. It was. I was able to speak to one soldier who was fighting under Rommel in Africa, and he confirmed that they were still using um, pavitin when they were fighting the British in Africa. And the British were already using amph amphetamine. So you can imagine the heat in Africa and, you know, one amphetamine fighting methamphetamine. Quite a crazy uh, situation, actually. So I have a theory, Norman, which I'll share with you. Please. You know, it's, it's so... Amphetamine sulfate is shorter acting, uh -huh. and, which means that it, it's not as good if you want to stay awake for long periods. But on the other hand, if you want to stay awake all night and then sleep in the day, you can. And I'm, I've often wondered whether the problem in the end with using uh, pervertine methamphetamine is that you never get enough sleep. So you can never, in the end, it catches up with you. You you become exhausted or paranoid or hallucinatory. And I think maybe the shorter acting amphetamines used by the Allies might have, in the end, turned out to be more effective in warfare. I, I'd be fascinated on your uh, 
your thoughts on that? I think you're absolutely right. And in London, there was a debate and I read some, some papers about it. I can't remember correctly who decided that, but there was like a commission or one person that had to decide whether amphetamine or methamphetamine would be better for the British soldier. And that person decided that it would be amphetamine. And there, there were tests being made before that with British soldiers, I think even pilots. And from these tests, the British uh, military gathered that amphetamine was, was the better choice. And it, it really was. But the Nazis, you know, were always crazy. So they always have to go for the stronger yes, choice. Yes, yes. Um, they could not, you know, start with methamphetamine and suddenly say, now we're only going to take amphetamine because it's better in the long run because there was no long run it's all it's all now you know it's happening now we're winning now we're overrunning now this is the blitz idea and the, the blitz idea just didn't work anymore because they were not able to conquer the world in 15 minutes you know it's a law it's it's it was a, it was a the, the the plan was had fall you know was faulty from the from from this from the start basically kind of reminds you know it, it's and we still haven't learned the lessons. I mean, I think one could uh, apply the same criticism to Iraq. It's quite easy to go in, but to come up with a sensible solution, I mean, it's the war of Afghanistan even, you know, you need, it's a much more complex thing than just rushing in and, and uh, taking over, supposedly. Okay, well, let's, let's given that the, um, the driver was Hitler, let's talk about Hitler and uh, the things you dug out on, on his from his medic, his doctor and the, and the medicines, share, you know, share with the uh, the listeners this amazing treasure trove that you uncovered. Well, I spoke with this one medicine historian who had worked a little bit on methamphetamine, and I said I would now also be interested in studying Hitler. And he said, "Oh, Hitler, that's it's not interesting. That's just you know, that's just it's just sensational stories. But why would you?" You know, a proper scientist wouldn't, you know, be interested in Hitler's drug use. But I was actually very interested in it. And online, again, there was just strange stuff about some weird doctor that Hitler had who had given him a lot of drugs. That was basically all you could find. And when you read the classical Hitler biographies, for example, by Ian Kershaw, great biography, and he also talks about this strange doctor. His name is Theo Morel, Theo Morel. But he also doesn't go into, and he, he writes also, Morel gave Hitler a lot of different drugs and medicines which affected Hitler's decision-making, something like this. I mean, this is, in a way, that this is the beginning of an investigation, but uh, no one had actually done that investigation. And the investigation could only be done by reading or by studying by studying the actual notes of this doctor and fortunately i was able to find these notes they are actually in the federal archives of germany in koblenz a, a town in the west germany is a decentralized country so the, the federal archives are not all in berlin some of them are in this small town called koblenz so i went to koblenz and i you know went to the archivists and i said i want to to see the records of Hitler's doctor and they said no problem they went to the to the storage room and and, and got me the original books uh, doctors like notebooks of this doctor and patient cards and it was everything was there and I could also see when I checked them out to 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 study them in the reading room I could also see like the the record of when these records had been looked at, you know, in the last, you know, decades, actually, and hardly anyone had looked at these records. So Hitler, the most, probably the most studied person in history, who had this very intense relationship with his doctor. In fact, he spent more time with Theo Morel than with any other person. They were best of friends and in the end in the bunker there were only two bedrooms in the bunker in Berlin one was for Hitler and the other one was for Morel so that this, this relationship which was at the core of the Nazi system and with its records being 
you could easily look at them because I just walked in and I looked at them. No one had actually had the idea to look at this. And when I looked at these records, then it actually I had the idea, I had the thought that this story that I'm researching right now, which I found incredibly fascinating, would be fascinating to quite a few people because it was like it was the actual fly on the wall. You know, you could the writings of this Morel were it was not just exact dates and ex in medicines and dosages and you know times it was also describing the situation that hitler was in and how he looked and what he said and what decisions he had to make and he dis had he was making and he was discussing this with morel and he said i have to you know do this or this and i feel kind of bad so what medication do we take now so i can be on top of my game because i'm waiting for 15 generals are coming from the front and they're going to tell me all these bad news, but I want to be in a good mood to overpower them with my new ideas. I mean, it was so rich in this very rich material. And so I was quite happy that that really felt like a gold mine that I had found in this archive. So about one third of the book Blitzed is kind of a pharmacological biography of Hitler between 1936, that was the year when he met Theo Morel and appointed him immediately as his personal physician, and late April 1945, when he chased Morel out of the bunker in Berlin and then committed suicide. As you'll probably be aware, we've surpassed an impressive milestone recently. With 100 episodes released the Drug Science Podcast over four years, we really couldn't be happier with the show. At Drug Science, we know times are tougher than ever, and not everyone can donate to support the show, and that's completely okay. But if you're enjoying the content and want to support us, there's a simple, free way to make a big impact. So instead of a donation, we'd be incredibly grateful if you could take just a few moments to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. So whether you're tuning in on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other platform of your choice, your reviews play a crucial role in boosting our visibility and our egos. So if you've laughed, learned, or found some joy in what we do, please consider sharing your thoughts. Your reviews not only warm our hearts, but also significantly contribute to our podcast, making it easier for others to discover and enjoy the content you love. So thank you so much for being a part of our community. Your support in any form really does mean the world to us. So keep listening, keep sharing, and don't forget to drop that review. And before I forget, don't forget to submit your questions for future guests via the Google form. So now back to the show. Do you think there's been a deliberate attempt not to, yeah, it, would you call this sort of active blindness because people didn't want there to be any other explanation for some of the bizarre behavior of Hitler? They don't want drugs to be an excuse. They, it want, they wanted him to be evil. Or is it, was it just no one realized they were there? Or I mean, it does seem such a very strange thing to have ignored for so long. Yeah, that is a very interesting question. I discussed this, this with Hans Moms and the leading historian. I said, why did you never you know, do this and look at it? And his explanation was, he said, we, we historians, we don't know anything about drugs. So we don't, you know, think this could, you know, be of any relevance. And also Nazi Germany in general is a very and was up until recently and still is obviously because it created the most horrific crimes that were ever committed by mankind. So it's, it's something that historians talk about or research or study with certain, in certain categories that have been established in universities and have been accepted. And I think only me or only someone who was not a trained historian could would have this idea to look at the drug use of of hitler that's why also the other historian who had told this this idea he said no don't do this this is not this is not serious historical research and i think that's uh, basically that's that's you know limited thinking so absolutely yeah you know, i had no problem 
looking at Hitler taking uh, cocaine in October 1944, looking exactly how much cocaine he would take on a certain day and then you know, describing how he had the idea of a second Ardennes offensive with his totally bloated ego uh, high on coke. Uh, while the reality, you know, his generals were like, he thought he's insane to have a second Ardennes offensive, like having no, you know, no manpower and no weaponry to do so. But he just, he still had the power to order it. And uh, he, on cocaine, he thought, yeah, I'm going to surprise everyone now. We're going to do the same thing again in the, uh, with the Aden Mountains than we did in 1940. On, I mean, it's, for me, that was, you know, fun or at least enlightening, you know, research, you know. And actually, it was fun. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun to discover this and to, to discover the whole you know, campaign and the whole course of the war and, and crucial decisions made by Hitler through this through this lens. And um, I also made sure, and I think I made it explicit in Blitz that, and also Hans Mommsen, my mentor, I would mention this uh, often that drugs are not the the only angle that you you know they don't explain everything but they do explain quite a bit and i think to leave them out was i think it was a blind spot by the let's call them conventional uh, historians that had been describing hitler for example before and uh, historians who had missed this point some of them really appreciated blitz uh, for example ian kershaw who endorses the book while others like Richard Evans still doesn't get it and still thinks this is uh, something that shouldn't have been done. This investigation shouldn't have been done because it's misleading, which I don't think it is at all. No, well, I, I'm just thinking of a more recent uh, example of a massive policy decision, the breaking up of the Soviet Union, which apparently occurred over at the end of a very, very, very drunken evening. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite possible. I mean, I read, I think there was an essay by the British Historical Society that maybe Blitz paved the way to enable historians more and more to also look at how drugs, you know, might have shaped decision making. And um, I mean, we all know that drugs are an integral part of every woman's and man's life and that they do alter us you know, all the time and that we think about drugs all the time and that we actually take drugs every day. And depending on which drugs we take, you know, our consciousness is different. And um, so I think they, it makes a lot of sense to, um, you know, look at the breakup of the Soviet Union and then to, you know, to examine why, you know, certain individuals were acting in, in certain ways, you know. Well, look, you, you don't have to convince me it's <laughs> drugs are interesting. I know, I know. I know. I guess, yeah. And of course, your enthusiasm and interest uh, has now moved into a second book, which is not yet available in English, but I think is coming out on the 9th of April. And it's called Yes, where you dig into the uh, interesting history of psychedelics. And I think also... My insiders, my German-speaking friends, tell me that uh, who've read the book tell me that there's an interesting link also to with uh, to Nazi Germany with psychedelics. So, share with the audience see the what they're going to get from the new book. Well, in in Blitz, I was also at the archives of the former concentration camp in Dachau because that was the place where one of the places, maybe the main place, where the Nazis did uh, experience experiments with psychedelics with mescaline it seemed and um, i was asking the archivist where is all this material and he said when the americans liberated the concentration camp they also took the uh, papers of an ss doctor called kurt plötner who made these uh, mes exper experiments with mescaline and possibly other uh, psychedelic substances and i thought that this um, i should examine this one day and in tripped i actually do because i was then very interested in also for a personal reason in in the history of psychedelics because my mother was is suffering from dementia and i was discussing in the family whether possibly lsd 
might help. And then my father, a former judge, said, well, if you think that LSD is such a possible medicine, why can't I get it in the pharmacy? Why is it an illegal drug that everyone is scared of? Basically, that was his reaction. And I said, well, I'm going to you know, actually have a look at why LSD, what happened in the very early development of LSD by the Swiss Sando company, why didn't they be, why weren't they able to, you know, put it properly, put it into the market and make it a medicine? What actually prevented them early on? Because, you know, it wasn't illegal, obviously it was just, you know, invented, you know, so what, 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 what went wrong in the early days of LSD? That was kind of my, the question that I wanted to answer for my father. And that is the story of Tripped. So what did you find? <laughs> Well, it was quite fascinating because I went to the archive that this time, not a state archive, but a company archive, which is the company archive of Sandos. Uh, Sandos is harder to get into, I bet, than the state one. (laughs) A little harder to get into, I imagine. Well, Sandos is not part of Novartis, which is one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And they are proud to have the oldest company archive in switzerland and that they are open they're very proud that they're open to the public oh i didn't and yeah yeah yeah. and uh, i was for the first time in a company archive and it was actually quite different because they don't have a find book so you don't know what is in the archive you're sitting in the in in the reading room and then the archivist comes and asks you what are you what are you interested in and then you kind of have to go through him or her, get to the documents that are really interesting. And I had read that there was a a meeting in Basel at the the headquarters uh, of Sandos at the time between an important CIA uh, person and the CEO of Sandos. And I wanted I wanted the description of that meeting. I wanted to read what was decided in that meeting, because after that meeting, Sandos did not continue to try to make LSD a medicine. They, they, really? they, they stopped, you know, pushing it uh, to to become uh, a medicine. But obviously, not obviously. I mean, but actually, this paper, or I, I don't, I don't know. I still don't know whether this meeting was recorded in a way that there was like a report on it, because I was not shown this, but. I was shown other things and um, I was visiting this archive quite often and I developed a personal relationship with the archivist. This is all in the book. This is actually quite funny. My relationship with the archivist from Novartis and trying to get him to show me what is really interesting. And he showed me more and more things. And the one thing, like the smoking gun maybe that I found in the archive was a letter from Richard Kuhn to the CEO of Sandos, Arthur Stoll. And I mean, that the decisive idea that I had, or one of the interesting ideas that I had was not to look at the papers of Albert Hoffmann, the discoverer, the famous discoverer of LSD, because basically everything is known about Albert Hoffmann and, you know, how he exactly found LSD and why, I mean, there's still stuff to be, you know, new stuff to be evaluated. Like Albert Hoffman always said, LSD found me. And it was kind of a mystical thing that I, you know, that, you know, this was suddenly in my lab, but it was actually a very rational decision by his superior, by the CEO of Sandos. The name is Arthur Stoll. Arthur Stoll basically founded the pharmaceutical branch of Sandos. Sandos was making colors before. And in 1917, Stoll was hired to create a pharmaceutical branch because Sandos made a lot of money with colors and they invested, you know, the gains in into the pharmaceutical you know, into a pharmaceutical branch. And Arthur Stoll was responsible for basically building up the startup. It was like a startup in 1917. And he decided to develop medicines out of ergot, this highly poisonous fungus that grows on rye. And he was able to, you know, make a few medicines out of ergot and it was successful. 
and that at one point in the late 30s, uh, Sandoz decided to produce ergot, which was before just collected, like people would walk through the fields in Portugal for Sandoz and collect, you know, t take the fungus from, from the rye grains and but this was not so much. And then in, 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 in the late 30s, they designated a valley in Switzerland, the Emmental, which uh, is famous for its cheese. They decided in Emmental, now they would actually grow er ergot on the rye. So it was not the rye anymore that they were interested. You know, they were not growing, the, the farmers were not growing rye anymore, but they were just growing rye so ergot could grow on the rye. And then Sandoz had a lot of ergot suddenly, and then they needed to make more, needed to create more products. And then Albert Hoffman was also ordered to look at all the different combinations or, th or things that he had already synthesized in 38. So in 43, he looked at LSD 25 again, because he had, you know, somehow in his head that this had, you know, could be interesting. So then he, he remade it again and then something came into his bloodstream and then he had to, you know, that, so it was actually not just a, a strange, you know, coincidence. It was actually, they were actually looking for new uh, medicines because Stoll wanted to make money with ergot because he already made money with ergot. So he wanted to make more money with ergot. And suddenly they had this LSD on their hand and they, you know, the first medicine, as Hoffman said, that didn't act on the body but actually on the mind and they were a bit overwhelmed with it uh, because it was so potent so they thought this could be really you know a really great you know thing for them this could actually be a breakthrough for the company I mean, they could you know maybe they had the strongest medicine for the mind on their hands which they had you know but they were not sure how to handle it and then what is what is the smoking gun that I previously spoke have spoken about was that I looked at Stoll's papers then that was that was the decision and I was able to convince the archivist that I wanted to see who Stoll was communicating with and what Stoll was actually you know trying to what what, what Stoll was actually deciding and what what he was thinking and um, I read through all the correspondence of Stoll the CEO and I found that his closest friend maybe or collaborator was a man called Richard Kuhn. They were so mm -hmm. close, Kuhn and Stoll, because they had had the same teacher and that, that teacher was mm -hmm. Richard Wildstetter. Richard Wildstetter was a German Jewish Nobel Prize winner uh, for chemistry mm -hmm. who had taught both of them. And then when Stoll, first Stoll, first Stoll was his prodigy and then Stoll went to Sandoz and then Richard Kuhn was Wildstetter's prodigy mm -hmm. and then Stoll and Kuhn had been collaborating and exchanging ideas since the 20s and had con continued to do so all the way you know till you know much later when LSD was found you know Kuhn was still you know kept in the loop Kuhn knew everything about ergot uh, research at Sandoz in the 30s and in, in the 40s and the interesting thing now, of course, is who is this Richard Kuhn? He was also a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry, but he was also uh, Hitler's leading biochemist. So Richard Kuhn uh, was working in Heidelberg uh, during the so-called Third Reich. And this was not, you know, in any way a problem for Stoll. You know, he, he would, the Swiss Germans... And the Germans, they were, you know, close friends who spoke, speak the same language. And also that the Germans were Nazis was not a big thing, not a problem for Sanders at the time. You know, the Swiss, Switzerland was neutral, so they would communicate with everyone. And um, Stoll was friends or at least, you know, exchanging ideas, had always exchanged ideas with Richard Kuhn. So Kuhn knew about LSD, Kuhn knew about the ergot research. And Kuhn, and this is the smoking gun, then in October 43, wrote a letter to Stoll, which I found in the uh, Novartis archive, thanking uh, Stoll for sending him, I think it was half a gram of ergotamine, which, you know, is easily turned into, into LSD. And then I became obviously interested in this question was only mescaline used in Dachau or was it also LSD? 
And so I ex examined this question then in my book, in Tripped. And this question then also was of great interest to the Americans. The Americans, indeed. You gave them the idea for MK Ultra. Huh? <laughs> well, this is kind of the traces that I'm trying to, you know, uncover or, you know, look at in, in Tripped. Because when the Americans here, the Americans had a secret unit attached to to their uh, invading uh, units. Uh, this and the mm -hmm. secret unit was called Alsos, and Alsos, Alsos' job was basically to find German scientists who were working on the nu German nuclear program. Right. Yes. Uh, because the Americans thought that the Germans are quite advanced in building a nuclear weapon, and they wanted to get to these nuclear scientists quicker than the Russians. Yes, yes. And Alsos had a, like a second, it was not only looking at nuclear research, but also at uh, biochemical weapons. And Richard Kuhn in Heidelberg was one of the first prominent scientists that was, uh, they were basically arrested because the question was always, did they commit war crimes? Will they be put on trial in Nuremberg? Or do they collaborate with the Americans and maybe even have a, a second career in America, like Werner von Braun, who, in, who developed the rockets, the, the V2 rockets that, that were used mm -hmm. against London and then later became, you know, was in America and, and helped uh, develop the American space program. So Kuhn was also one of these scientists that decided that collaborating with the Americans was the better choice than being uh, in, in Nuremberg and, and maybe, you know, be sentenced to death or, uh, I mean, which also happened to, you know, some scientists. So Kuhn was um, speaking about LSD early on, already in the spring of 1945 to the Americans. And immediately, and this can all be traced in do by documents, um, immediately an American general, if I recall correctly, his name was Clay, but we have to look in tripped to find that, that you know immediately flew immediately flew to Heidelberg and uh, was ha, ha, had a briefing with Kuhn and then traveled the next day he traveled uh, to Switzerland and met uh, with the son of Arthur Stoll and received LSD from the son of Arthur Stoll and then LSD was in American hands and the Americans loved LSD because they thought this really this can be the truth drug that the Nazis were always searching for. This could actually be the truth drug. And the Americans were now also searching for the truth drug because the Nazis were searching for the truth drug. So it must be, you know, important to have a truth drug, especially in the uh, Cold War that was now starting. It was a war, you know, about the mind, about, you know, truth and, uh, you know, finding out who is your friend and who is, you know, the traitor, who is the other, who is... And so LSD became very interesting for the Americans. And then sometime later, there was this meeting that I was initially searching for of the CIA operative, mm -hmm. which was probably Sidney Gottlieb uh, with Arthur Stoll in the Basel headquarters. So I, actually, mm -hmm. you could say that the connection between Stoll and Kuhn and Stoll's decision to share uh, sensitive scientific information with Germans who are Nazis was the beginning of the end of LSD during that time as a, as a medicine, yeah. basically, because the Americans thought this is a, this is, this should not be a medicine. This should be a weapon. This should be our weapon. And if it's our weapon, we, we are controlling it and it cannot be. You know, it cannot be a medicine if it's going to be used for military purposes. I think we kind of understand yeah. it's too valuable. Yeah. However, we, we better finish soon, Normans, but you've resurrected it or something similar uh, for your mother. Tell us some more about that, please. Well, at one point I came back to my father with this you know, story that I touched on now and um, we discussed LSD and um, he actually decided to, after also discussing it with my mother, obviously, who could still, you know, sense or take part in this discussion, to use um, LSD against her dementia in microdose form. We had read, I had read one paper about it, that it might help. So he was 
just he said there's no conventional medicine on the market why don't we try it i think he he made the judgment being a former judge uh, that he could you know do it and my mother he also takes it uh, but he hardly reacts to it while my mother actually reacts uh, very well to it and she has significant cognitive improvements when she's what my father calls when, when there's a drop day when he when she receives a drop of of 10 micro uh, micrograms in the coffee in the morning she has a cognitive she speaks better she's more happy she's more energetic so he's quite happy that he finally has a medicine even if it's an illegal drug in his hands that seems to be at least treating the symptoms yeah we have no idea obviously whether it you know could stop a disease as as you know vicious as alzheimer's but it makes it's better for her she likes it it has clinical value i I mean and absolutely and uh I mean, it's brave of you and he to to go public with this, though, because, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm presumably you, they're still in Germany, so it is still illegal. Yes. It's illegal in Germany, but I, I write about it in Tript, and the lawyer checked it, and the way it is uh, presented now is uh, okay. My father says he's, he's ready for the police to stand at his door. Uh, he would actually kind of like it, probably, yeah. because he's, you know, a man of the law and uh, he he's spoken on German TV about it so it's he's quite uh, brave and open about it and so am I well we do need people like him and you and it's absolutely fantastic talking to you I'll just emphasize again repeat to, to the listeners that the book is coming out on the 9th of April and we're hoping that soon after you will be in London launching your book and i will be meeting you in person and talking to you about uh, some of what we've talked about today and probably some other things as well so those of you who are want to come to that book launch of norman's uh, obviously you all follow me on twitter i will be tweeting and drug science will be making an, an announcement on our website as well so f- watch this space and uh, and hopefully we can episode two of the uh, the blitzed and tripped story will happen then. But it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I, it's great to have a historian who's interested in pharmacology. There are quite a lot are interested in science, but very few in pharmacology. So I, as a pharmacologist, as well as a psychiatrist, I, I want to thank you personally for, for <laughs> showing people how interesting and important pharmacology is. Thank you very much, Norman. Well, thanks. And very much looking forward to seeing you in London I'm also also read your new book psychedelics and it's it's really mind opening to me even though I really know quite a lot about it uh, it's still good to you know have it all in between two covers and I'm really looking forward to meeting you and discussing various topics uh, in person on the 18th hopefully thanks a lot for having me on your podcast thank you